Hi, I'm Larry Castle here with Ken Brown for episode 32 of That's a Good Question. Is the deep state out to get Donald Trump? Hey, Pastor Ken, it has been 10 days now since we all watched those horrific scenes of people storming our nation's capital Uh, sending congressmen and congresswomen, senators literally running for their lives and resulting in five people actually losing their lives, including a police officer that was killed by the mob. And last week, we started to answer the question, why did the riot happen? Why did the Capitol riot happen? And we said that people were led to believe something that was untrue, that the election had been stolen and also that the vice president and or the Congress could do something about it on that day. And today we're going to continue that. You said last week that other than 9-11, it was the worst day of your life as an American. But this attack wasn't uh, perpetrated by foreign terrorists. You know, these Mm -hmm. were homegrown terrorists, if you will, made in America. Mm -hmm. And uh, not only were the insurrectionists American, They were from our side of the political divide, and the vast majority of conservatives, uh, those on the political right, would never think of doing such a thing and are appalled at what they saw like like we've expressed. But the same is true of Muslims. Most would never detonate a bomb at the Boston Marathon or fly a plane into a building on 9-11, but most of us think that the Muslim community Mm -hmm. has a problem and it needs to address it. And it appears that we do as well. Yeah, I think that's uh, well put. Uh, The attack on the the Capitol and on our electoral system was perpetrated by people affiliated with really what's the the law and order party. Neither you nor I has ever voted for the other party. And we've been concerned with violence on the left like we saw last summer. But I remind folks again that I don't see my job as cleaning up someone else's house. And so if you're inclined to ask you know, why I'm not condemning what happened in the summer as I condemned what happened at the Capitol, well, that's because that protest uh, that turned into a riot uh, last week was from our side and the summer riots were, were not. So if you're a conservative, as we are, then this should open you, should open us to some introspection of our movement and what has gone wrong. And that's what we're seeking to answer in these episodes. As we pointed out last week, we're not just uh, politically conservative. We and our viewers are primarily Christian conservatives. And because Mm -hmm. of that, we of all people should be concerned about what we've been talking about throughout many of these episodes, a common thread, and that is the truth. And we should only make claims that we can prove. So we left off last week uh, where you, citing a narrative that many, many conservatives, Christian or not, have come to believe. And namely, that is that President Trump is the victim of some nefarious campaign on the part of the deep state to get the president. And uh, at first to keep him from getting elected. And uh, then now as we've gone on, uh, after he was elected, Uh, much to their chagrin, to get him out of office. So today we want to pick that up and address the question, is the deep state out to get Donald Trump? Yeah, I think it's an important question. Uh, Donald Trump's not going to be the president in a a few days, but he's not going to disappear in all likelihood. And as I mentioned last week, whether he personally disappears or not, this whole process of the deep state and that they're out to get us and only listening to one side is going to continue. So I'm hoping that our viewers are open to considering whether we've been misled on this matter. So at the outset, I ask you all, I ask you all to just take a deep breath, have an open mind to what we're going to be saying. And if what we say you don't agree with, then that's okay. I just thank you in advance for giving us an an honest listen. And we're saying it because what happened with the claims about the election are, as we said last week, they're really of a piece with the claims about elements in the government having it in for Donald Trump. 
with the stolen election just really being the latest attempt, followed now by this second impeachment in under a year now. Yeah, two impeachments. Uh, <laughs> there have only been four in our nation's history, and right. President Trump has two of them. In you said the same year. It hadn't really occurred to me until I heard you say that in mm -hmm. under a year. Mm -hmm. uh, that seems to be prima facie evidence that he has been subjected to more persecution in many people's minds, right? Well, you know, of course, people can disagree about when an impeachment is appropriate. Neither you nor I have the final word on that, and we don't claim to. Uh, in order to answer whether he should have been impeached either time, you need to discuss his conduct and whether it's particularly egregious and meets the constitutional standard. Now, again, people can and do disagree, and I don't have any particular dog in that fight. I would point out that one of the other two presidents who's been impeached was Bill Clinton in our lifetimes, in the, in the 90s. And Democrats, uh, my friends uh, on the right, say the same thing about him and his wife, Hillary, that they've been victims of persecution and overreach. She's, in fact, famous uh, for saying that there was a vast right-wing conspiracy against her and her husband when she was first lady. Now, it is the case that when Bill Clinton was president in his first year, his first year, a special counsel was appointed to investigate the Whitewater matter. If you don't remember what Whitewater was, you know, good for you, really. <laughs> but it was an investigation, and he subjected to it, and it was going to be a hassle for him. And it became much more of a hassle as time went on. In his second year, the House and Senate opened investigations. Eight months after that special counsel was appointed, he was replaced, but not with a special counsel, but with an independent counsel. Some may remember the name Kenneth Starr, who was the yeah. independent counsel. So, so hang on a second. What's the difference between an independent counsel and a special counsel? Well, to our viewers, I urge you, I ask you to kind of stay with me as I geek out a bit, <laughs> explaining some of this. I tease Pastor Larry about his fascination with technology, and we here affectionately call him Pastor Geek sometimes. But I'm a, a bit of a political geek myself. I'm going to try to avoid being too boring on this, but I do think it's important for context on how some see President Trump's trials and travails and whether he's really been a victim of the so-called deep state. Uh, the other uh, side says the same thing about the, the Clintons. The Clintons were investigated not by a special counsel, but an independent counsel, and uh, not investigated for under two years like President Trump was, but for four years. And not about one matter, contacts with Russia, but about at least four. There was white water that got it started, but then there was something called Travelgate and then Filegate, and then there was the uh, the Lewinsky affair. Now, why were the Clintons investigated so much? Well, Republicans say, well, it's because they were so sleazy. <laughs> they had a lot of investigations because there was a lot to investigate. But with President Trump, many of the same folks believe he's been persecuted. So we'll we'll discuss that. But President Trump was really very fortunate to have a special counsel instead of an independent counsel like Clinton had. And here's, here's why. An independent counsel cannot be fired like Clinton had. They have an unlimited budget, have an unlimited amount of time to investigate, and they're required to send a report to Congress. And that'll be important a, a bit later. A special counsel is appointed by the attorney general. And the attorney general works for the president. So just stop and think about that now. Hmm. Robert Mueller, whose name we'll remind you of a little bit later, uh, was the special counsel looking into the Russia affair, but he was not an independent counsel. So he was not giving a report to Congress. Uh, he was reporting to the attorney general and serving under the attorney general, but the attorney general works for the president and he issues a report then to the person who appointed him, who works for the president who appointed that guy. An independent counsel is truly more independent than a special counsel. I'll just uh, insert here, the independent counsel idea goes back to the 70s and Richard Nixon because investigating Watergate was a special counsel. But it was the same kind of setup we have now where he served under the attorney general. Well, President Nixon 
came to dislike this, what the special counsel was doing. <laughs> so he ordered a guy who works for him, the attorney general, fire Archibald Cox. And Elliot Elliot Richardson said no, and he resigned. Went to the number two in the Justice Department, a guy named William Ruckelshaus. Ruckelshaus refuses, and and he then resigns. And it's called the Saturday Night Massacre, uh, Mm -hmm. famously. And then they had to go to the number three in the Justice Department, the Solicitor General of the United States. Now get this name. Guess who that was? None other than Robert Bork. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Robert Bork, who would be nominated to the Supreme Court in the mid eighties by Ronald Reagan. He was third in line. He did the deed. He fired Archibald uh, Cox. And so then Congress got involved and the the country turned on Nixon for doing that very quickly. And some of you are old enough to remember all of that. So the reason the independent counsel law was then passed after the Nixon debacle was so that you wouldn't have a president who could then fire the person who's in effect, fire the person who's investigating him. But that's what you had with the Russia investigation. You had a special counsel, not an independent counsel. The issue of to whom that investigation report goes is going to be important a bit later. So just keep that in mind. In the case of Clinton, the report went to Congress. In the case of Trump, it went to Trump's employee, really, the attorney general. Hmm. So, so why didn't uh, President Trump have an independent counsel investigating him like Clinton did? It's because that the independent counsel law expired in 1999 and it's not been renewed. And the reason is there just became too many independent counsel appointments. There were too many of them looking into too many things. I mentioned they had unlimited time, unlimited budget. And so it was deemed to not have sufficient uh, borders around it, safeguards to keep the independent councils on track and from going on witch hunts. Now, where have I heard that Mm. (laughs) term before? (laughs) As you know, President Trump has incessantly called the Russia investigation a hoax and a witch hunt. He mentioned uh, the witch hunt just this week in connection with the impeachment vote, and he explicitly connected it with the Russia and the so-called hoax that was the Russia investigation. Well, I find it interesting, at least, that back in the 90s, when Clinton is going through all of his travails, uh, 1999, the New York Times published an article titled this, White House Paints Star Inquiry as Witch Hunt. And it said this, White House officials are anticipating a report to Congress from Kenneth Starr by aggressively trying to undercut the reliability of his witnesses and questioning their ties to top Republican officials. Clinton's political aides are also painting the the investigation as a partisan witch hunt intended to humiliate the president. The aides cite recent critical comments by Republican leaders as evidence of their collusion with Starr, the independent counsel who's investigating a variety of financial, legal, and sexual matters involving the president. Wow, doesn't that sound doesn't that sound familiar in many ways? Clinton's people complained regularly of how much time and money the Starr investigation took. And president Trump has taken a page really from the Clinton pay- playbook in all respects. He's being targeted politically in a, a witch hunt from early on in his presidency and it's continued unabated. On our side of the political aisle, if someone asked why the Clintons were investigated so much, we'd say because they'd done so much that needs to be investigated. And they still got away with it, is the way many people on our side uh, look at it. But when it comes to President Trump, the existence of the investigation is really just evidence of people in the deep state who are out to out to get him. Hmm. Now, one other parallel between the Clintons and President Trump Both were accused of improper relationships with foreigners to help get elected. Uh, For the Clintons, it was China. And for Trump, it has been Russia. So Mm -hmm. it would seem important to know whether, in fact, he was mistreated in the Russia investigation, right? Yeah, I I think it is uh, important to know uh, to know that whether he was mistreated, really mistreated uh, for a couple of, of reasons. The president and his defenders refer to it almost daily. I mean, it's almost literally daily in his defense for, for four years now. And in fact, it's not a hoax and witch hunt, but you've been told it is by your information sources for four years. Mm-hmm. And so my hope is that you'll rethink 
that. You'll rethink those sources. Again, as we go through it, if uh, you don't agree, well, then so be it. But that's a part of the objective. The objective here is to hopefully give pause regarding the news sources that we consult that have, uh, I believe, from talking to a number of folks who would view this podcast, those news sources that we're going to have, I believe, misled us, culminating in a willingness now to believe what we've never believed, that you could have a conspiracy so vast and so wide that it involves Democrats and Republicans from different states. It involves voting officials that are hired and volunteer. It involves voting machine software and hardware companies. It involves the attorney general who said there's no evidence of widespread fraud. It involves the Republican governor of Georgia, the Republican secretary of state of Georgia, the Republican governor of the state of Arizona, and, and on it goes. And so all of this is, as I say, is of a piece. And I think it would be good for us to just think about whether or not the foundation of all of this, going back to the beginning and the, and the Russia so-called hoax witch hunt is really that. Uh, and, and it is really important, I want to reiterate, that uh, folks know why mm. we're doing this. The end game is to help us develop the best discernment we can uh, because we live in a day when we're just flooded with information. Yeah, that's that's right. That's right. The uh, the narrative told by the president and conservative uh, media for, for four years is this. Democrats conspired to tie Trump and his campaign to Russia, saying that he colluded with Russia for help in winning the 2016 presidential election. They say that, in fact, the Clinton campaign paid for a guy, Christopher Steele, to research Trump's connections to Russia and he really made things up and put them in a series of reports that became a, a dossier, the infamous Steele dossier, it's called. Now, the dossier made its way to the Obama FBI during the 2016 campaign, and they used it to open an investigation into Trump and his people and their ties to, to Russia. And then it uh, went so far as to use this fake report to get warrants to spy on Trump's people, and they used the fraudulent Steele dossier to, to do that. Former FBI Director James Comey, some of his minions, people like Peter Strzok and Lisa Page initiated all of this, going after Trump's people, people like Michael Flynn, for no, no good reason. So a few months after Trump became president, he fired Comey, who, according to Trump, is a, quote, dirty cop, that should have, and that should have ended the witch hunt FBI investigation, but, but it did not. Trump's attorney general for his first two years was a guy named Jeff Sessions. And because Sessions had worked on Trump's campaign and had himself had contact with Russians during that time, he recused himself from dealing with all things Russia related. Trump was furious with Sessions for recusing himself, and he threatened to fire him several times over the next year and a half. It fell to Deputy Attorney General, a guy named Rod Rosenstein, to determine what to do with the FBI investigation. He decided to appoint a special counsel, special counsel Robert Mueller, who started his work five months into Trump's presidency in May of, of 17. Mueller spent nearly two years, 22 months, millions of dollars, and he, along with uh, what Trump often called 17 angry Democrat lawyers, investigating. So I'm just giving you the, the narrative as many people uh, have understood it for these, these four years. Uh, in fact, a couple of the people on Mueller's team, Strzok and Page, had previously texted, texted each other about how much they hated Trump. And they even talked about the investigation being a, quote, insurance policy to keep him from becoming president. After 22 months, the report was finished in March of uh 2019, and Mueller released his report to the attorney general. Remember, because he now works under, he's not an independent counsel, he's under the attorney general. So he gives the report to the attorney general. And the attorney general at that point uh, in tw last year, 2019, summarized the nearly 500 page report in simply three and a half pages that were released to the public uh, and said this, in effect, they came up with nothing. 
total exoneration, no collusion with Russia, no obstruction uh, of the investigation by the president. In fact, not only were Trump and his people innocent, it's Comey and Mueller and their people who are guilty of fabricating a reason for the investigation in the first place, and they should be in jail. That scandal, uh, so-called scandal, is variously called Russia Gate or Obama Gate, emphasizing that the real scandal is not the Trump campaign in Russia, but the deep state's campaign against the president, about which the president has complained bitterly. The president and his supporters have pointed to the Russia investigation as a hoax and a witch hunt that was just the beginning of the attempted coup against a duly elected president. The Ukraine scandal, which is, Pastor Larry, as you said, it seems like forever ago, but it was only a year ago, <laughs> and the impeachment that, that followed that, and then that, now the stolen election, and now another impeachment, they are all part of the attempt to take down the president. Now, that's the narrative, and, and I believe I've related it faithfully. I believe I've gotten most of the important points in there. If you believe the president is the victim of a witch hunt, then I hope I've included the main points that make that hoax witch hunt uh, case. I haven't uh, included every detail or every name, obviously, but I've not left anything out of the narrative intentionally. And if I left something important out, then I would be glad to, to hear about that. Uh, but I take it you see some holes in that. <laughs> Yeah, you could you could assume that. Uh, and holes is a good way to characterize it because some of the narrative, as we're going to see, is true, uh, but it's incomplete. Hmm. And an incomplete narrative, hear this, friends, is a deceptive narrative. Hmm. To put Str it another strategically way. Strategically incomplete? Yes, yes, absolutely, on purpose. To put it another way, a half truth is a whole lie. Especially so if it's repeated over and over and over and over again in the incomplete fashion. The, the major flaw with the generally accepted narrative on the Russia hoax is not so much what it says, but what it does not say. In particular, it focuses on one portion of the full narrative, and that's the beginning portion. The focus is on how the investigation started, not what the investigation found. In fact, if you correspond with folks who get their news from conservative outlets only, they will send you documents and links, and they're all going to be, or nearly all going to be, about issues in 2016, about how the investigation began and who was involved and the mistakes that were made and possibly crimes that were committed. And if you ask what the investigation found, you're generally going to get some variation of they came up with nothing total exoneration, no collusion with Russia, no obstruction uh, of the investigation by the president. Now, we're going to see that uh, I think that's not true. But for now, just notice that generally all that's said about what's been found by the Russia investigation is they got nothing. Hmm. But where the real attention is focused is on the beginnings of the investigation, how it got started and supposedly why it got started, which was to take down the president even before he began his presidency. Okay, so so there's the beginning of the investigation when Trump was running for president, and then there's the actual meat of the investigation, which took which took place years later. Is that right? That that is, yeah, that's right. Uh, if you if you focus on the beginning, and then people like Christopher Steele and Peter Strzok, Lisa Page, and Carter Page, who's unrelated by the way to Lisa Page, and then FISA warrants, uh, I'll explain all of that in a minute. That's fine, and it absolutely should be talked about, but it's not getting to the investigation's findings at all. And think about this. I just ask you to think about this, friends. If you're focused on how the investigation was started and not on what it found, well, then that's a sweet deal if you're the one who was being investigated. So for those convinced of the narrative that Comey and the FBI were out to get Trump, I don't need to re repeat the names and all the greatest hits because they're played over and over and over again. And those of you who have heard that and repeated that, you know who they are. I will say a few things about the beginning of the investigation during the 2016 campaign, and then list a bit of what the real investigation accomplished. 
Uh, because there were questions about whether the FBI opened the Russia investigation to harm Trump, the Justice Department Inspector General opened an investigation into that question, into the question of what were the origins of the crossfire hurricane? That was the FBI's name for the, the Russia investigation. Now, the Department of Justice Inspector General. Now, what's the Inspector General? Uh, one of the great things, I think, that our government has implemented over the last several decades is this Inspector General idea. Every major department in the government, so the Department of Justice, the Department of Agriculture, Department of Treasury, uh, Department of Defense, all of them, they have a designated inspector general. And the idea is for better government, that if people see something that's amiss, they can go to the inspector general. There's a process for submitting uh, what you've seen uh, in secret so that you don't lose your job, so that you're not harmed, so that you're not intimidated, all of that. And then they can do an investigation. Now, I think the inspector general can also open a, an investigation his or herself. If they've heard about something, it doesn't necessarily have to come directly from, from somebody. But the Justice Department has an inspector general. His name is Michael Horowitz. And Horowitz looked into this for over a year. His report says this. I'm reading from the Horowitz report about how things got started, about uh, the, some of the persons that were involved. He says, we found that while Lisa Page attended some of the discussions, she did not play a role in the decision to open the investigation or the four individual cases against Paul Manafort, Carter Page, Michael Flynn, George Papadopoulos. Strzok was directly involved in the decisions to open the investigation and those four individual cases, but we found that he was not the sole or even the highest level decision maker as to any of those matters. Strzok's supervisor told us that ultimately he was the official who made the decision to open the investigation. Strzok then prepared and approved the formal documentation as required. Evidence reflected that this decision by the supervisor was reached by consensus after multiple days of discussions and meetings that included Strzok and other leadership. He goes on to say, we similarly found that the decisions to open the four individual cases were reached by consensus of the investigation's agents and analysts who identified individuals associated with the Trump campaign who had recently traveled to Russia or had other alleged ties to Russia, and that the supervisor was involved in those decisions. The formal documentation opening each of those was approved by Strzok as required by the FBI's Domestic Investigations Operations Guide. We did not find documentary or testimonial evidence that political bias or improper motivation influenced the decision to open the Russia investigation. The evidence also showed the FBI officials responsible for and involved in the case, opening the, op those case opening decisions were unanimous in their belief that information from a friendly foreign government, and I'll say who that was in a minute, reflected the Russian government's potential next step to interfere with the 2016 US election. These FBI officials were similarly unanimous in their belief that this friendly foreign government information represented a threat to national security that warranted further investigation by the FBI. Witnesses told us they did not recall observing during these discussions any instances or indications of proper improper motivations or political bias on the part of the participants, including Strzok. Can, can I just interject here? Um, yeah, please. So just making sure I'm following you, that's a lot of information. Uh, yeah. So we're saying, uh, I'm just drawing an analogy in my mind. If you know, you're know you just peeved at me and you have got it out for me and you start taking a really close look at me um, mm -hmm. and you find out that you know I stole this money from over here and I might have done this thing and I've got some questionable things going on. Um, it doesn't really, uh, it might be, there might be a problem with the reason you started doing this. And in police work, sometimes that rules mm. out, you know, if you went about mm. it the wrong way, it rules out whether or not you can use stuff you found later. But that's kind of the analogy with what's going on. People are pointing to saying there are problems with why this investigation was started. But then what you're telling us here is, uh, that was even looked into, and that's in question. Perhaps there aren't problems. Is that right? 
Yeah, thank you. I think that's a great way to put it. Uh, I am reading for you the the one source that I know about uh, whose job it is to do this, the Inspector General Michael Horowitz for the Justice Department, did his investigation, released his report December of 2019, December 2019. It's available for you to read, and that's what I'm reading from. And he found what I've said there. Now, uh, there is, as I'm going to mention, another investigation going on the same thing, going on as we speak. <laughs> for reasons that I'll give in a minute. So it might, it may well, it may turn out that there are more problems than what Horowitz concluded. He did a thorough investigation, but you know, you do a second one, you might find things that he, that he didn't find. And if he finds those uh, other things, and if people committed crimes or if people did uh, Im improper things to open the investigation, then it is great for our government to know that and for that to be addressed. And Horowitz found some problems that I'm going to talk about too. Having said that, though, you're also, though, pointing out something I think important, which is a case I'm trying to make, which is even if all that's true, mm -hmm. that's the beginning. What about it? What about what actually happened? Right. And I just think I just don't think it's a good idea to focus your art artillery on the beginning and whatever missteps may or may not have happened with that without actually looking at what was found. So. Uh, it's all important uh, because it's an independent investigation that Horowitz did into the beginning of the investigation in 2016. It's saying that the decision to open the case was based on a proper foundation and the decisions to investigate particular people uh, were also proper too. And now I just want you to think about this is just a logical thing on my part um, and see if you think it's logical. Can everybody remember back to 2016 and you had Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton as the two nominees. I mean, literally, I can think of two people in 2016 who thought Donald Trump was, who made a prediction that there's gonna be a big upset. That there, you couldn't find anybody. <laughs> and you certainly couldn't find anybody in May and June and July of 2016 who thought that Trump was going to win. So it, it just doesn't make sense to me. Now, again, the, there may be, with this other investigation, things that are found, and if they are, great. But it just doesn't make sense to me that the deep state would really get all of its gears in motion in order to stop the Trump train that never, no one really thought was coming. Hmm. Everybody, and, and not only that, <laughs> not only did nobody think Trump was going to win, not only that, they were busy looking at Hillary all summer. Again, just mm -hmm. I just want to remind you, James Comey and Peter Strzok, some of these very names that later got involved with the Russia investigation, they're looking at Hillary Clinton's server and her emails and whether she improperly used a State Department server. And, you know, you may that may jog your memory about some of that. Looked into that. I think it was July 7th of 2016. Uh, Comey holds a news conference and he goes through all of these things that Hillary Clinton did wrong. And there were a bunch of them. And I thought he was going to say, therefore, we are indicting her. And then he said something like, you know, she was extremely careless. That was the word he think he used. And that didn't right, quite reach the bar for prosecution, which was amazing to many of us that he didn't do that. And he took a lot of criticism and I think warranted for not because of some of the egregious things she did. But then later they found more information. That laptop showed up. You guys remember this? The elections in November, this laptop shows up in late October. And he's now faced with, what do I do with this information? Mm. And normally the Justice Department has a rule that we're not going to make decisions and announcements in a month or it, maybe even two months before an election. That's what they try to do. So they don't sway the election uh, if they can avoid it. Yeah. But he had, he had sworn to Congress earlier that if new information comes up, you know, I'll tell you about it. Well, so two weeks before the election, he says, we've got this laptop. It becomes public two weeks that there may still be stuff with Hillary's emails. Listen, if the FBI hurt anybody in 2016, it hurt Hillary Clinton. Hmm. The FBI did not hurt Donald Trump in 2016. If that was their objective, they actually did the opposite with the investigation with her. They had, we know now, that the FBI opened their investigation into Trump campaign in Russia on July 16th, 2016, excuse me, July 31st, 2016, July 31st, 2016. We did not learn about it until after he was president. We didn't learn about it until March of the following year. 
when James Comey was before a congressional committee and he announced that in July we opened and we have this ongoing, we have this ongoing investigation. Prior to that, the public, the Congress didn't know it, <laughs> that they had this ongoing investigation. Now, I just want you to think about this. If what they wanted to do was sink Trump, hmm. leaking that you've got an active FBI investigation into the campaign in Russia would have been a great way to do it, especially after in October, again, where it seems like forever, the Access Hollywood tape had come out and his campaign was reeling. This yeah. was an extremely close camp uh, election. Hillary Clinton won the popular vote by 3 million votes. It was, it was very close. Um, ended up being electoral, same thing that we had in this, this election, but in some of the states like this election, vote very close. So would that have swung it? You know, I don't know. None of us knows. But if you really were looking to hurt uh, Trump, leaking that he's being investigated and his campaign's being investigated would seem to be a way to do that. Now, there were indeed, so those of you who are familiar with the beginnings and you know the story and you've heard this narrative over and over, you know these names. I want to make sure that you know that I know. And I recognize Peter Strzok and Lisa Page were quite a pair. They work for the FBI. They were having an affair. They were having an affair. They hated Trump. In fact, we know this because we have their text messages. Now, how do we have their text messages? We have their text messages because the inspector general subpoenaed the text messages in order to find out everything he could about how the thing got started, whether there was a political motivation for it and all of that. He subpoenaed these things. He gets them. He sees these and he sees these people are having an affair. That's not illegal. It's immoral, not illegal. So that didn't really interest him so much. But what they said to each other really interested him for good reason. They were just saying some things about Trump that they clearly hated Trump. Peter Strzok in particular, Lisa Page wasn't was kind of a bit player, but Strzok was more than a bit player. So he then, when he finds those, in 2017, Horowitz. He takes them to, uh, he takes them to Jim Com not Jim Comey, uh, Robert Mueller. Mueller had just started his own investigation, middle of 2017. Horowitz says, "Hey, you've got a guy in your team in Struck, who has said these things about Trump." Mueller gets that, and Mueller removes him from his team. Now, for me, this is important. Mm -hmm. in twofold. One, it was the deep state that discovered the deep state. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was actually the government that discovered this, gave it to Mueller. And Mueller's apparently not in on the deep state thing uh, and Horowitz. They did what I see, at least in this instance, as being their job. He removed Strzok from the investigation, even though Horowitz ended up concluding that the thing Strzok did while he was with the FBI on this investigation we're not political bias and all that. Whether you agree with them or not, that's what he said. But still, for appearance's sake, they wanted him off. He was on the Mueller probe for a month, a month. So, friends, the idea that Peter Strzok is the guy that produced the Mueller report or had a major hand in the Mueller report just is not is not the case. Hmm. So, they and they also said, um, go ahead. I was just going to say, so as I'm, I'm trying to track with you on all these details, um, uh, this this points to the fact that, um, like you said, the deep state discovered the deep state, that what we have here seems to be people trying to do their jobs, uh, though there are always people who may have an ulterior motive. There's uh, human motives can be a complex thing, but you have the machinery here kind of working and exposing that and it's none, none of it's perfect and you're not claiming that it is but I kind of I kind of am getting that from you you're saying so if if we're going to say that struck is the fly in the ointment here this is why you can't trust any of this well that's not really the case from what you're saying that yeah I you know now again there are, are there's another set of eyes that I'm going to mention in a bit that's looking into it and, and there may be more and the the theory is at least, that there's more than struck involved. That actually what a lot of people on, on the right-wing narrative say is that it, it goes all the way to Obama. That's why it's called Obamagate. <laughs> and the president has said that, that Obama did this and Obama authorized these things. I, I don't know. That's not been proven to my knowledge. And I keep up on this fairly well. I have not seen that proven anywhere. 
But if it is proven, I want to know about it. And I'm glad that it's being looked into. I'm simply giving you what I know from what we have thus far. And you've described it well. Yeah. Now, Struck and Page, when there are texts going back and forth, one of the really infamous things that was said in these texts was she says to him, she's she's mortified at the possibility that there's this Russian involvement in the election. They're seeing some of these connections that are going on between the Trump campaign and Russia that I'll mention. And she's mortified at that, and she hates Trump anyway. And so she says to him something like, hey, he's not going to become president, right? Um, and in fact, we know he's not going to become president because remember what I said, nobody thought he was going to become president. <laughs> and Strzok says something, says this to her, but we need to investigate, we need the investigation as an insurance policy. And that, I'm telling you, that phrase has gotten more mileage in four years. And it is a, it's a, a, a very unfortunate, to put it mildly, phrase. Mm -hmm. Now, the way it's interpreted is that the investigation itself was an insurance policy in case he wins. An, another way to look at that and, and, and the way that they claim it was being said was, look, she's saying he's not going to win. So these connections with Russia aren't going to harm the government because he's not going to win anyway. And Strzok is replying and saying, well, you know, that's why you get insurance policies <laughs> because of things you don't think are going to happen, but they could. And so we need to continue the investigation as an insurance policy in case he does win. Well, lo and behold, he did win. But anyway, that's one of the infamous phrases out of these, out of these texts. In addition, uh, during 2016, while the FBI, before Mueller ever comes on the scene, the FBI crossfire hurricane is looking into this. They go to a FISA court. It's the uh, federal, uh, the federal uh, surveillance act, federal investigative surveillance act, and the idea. Oh, foreign investigations. That's what it is. I'm sorry. I knew I got something wrong. Foreign investigation surveillance. I was going to correct you, but I didn't want to seem like. Yeah, thanks. All. Foreign. <laughs> The foreign investigate, and the idea here is that the FBI has this means to get surveillance warrants if they believe a foreign government is meddling in some way. Uh, so, but they have a special court called the FISA court, and they have to fill out an application for a warrant, a FISA warrant, to surveil uh, an American citizen, if and to see what's going on. So one of these American citizens was a guy named Carter Page, and the FBI was very suspicious about his activities with Russia. He had also was an unpaid foreign policy advisor for the Trump campaign, had been announced as such by the president, Carter Page, and he has these connections with Russia. So they asked for these warrants. They asked for them four times. And the inspector general found that in these warrants, that they had 17 instances in the four warrants of errors and omissions, things that they should have included that they didn't, uh, things that they did include that weren't properly worded, that kind of thing, uh, including, including that steel dossier that I mentioned earlier. Uh, they now, by this time, have access to the steel dossier that the Clinton campaign had paid for. They have it. And they're using portions of that to get the warrant because in the Steele dossier, it actually has stuff about this guy, Carter Page. And so they're using some of that. Now, they didn't say in those applications, this thing came from ultimately from the Clinton campaign. And the inspector general roundly criticized them for these errors and omissions and so on. So again, that's a, that's a great thing. It's all true. And, um, and, and all of that. However, uh, that was not, the Steele dossier was not the reason that the investigation was open. Uh, and those warrants uh, with regard to Carter Page, the thing that that harmed was it's a process issue, an important process issue that's got to be fixed and should never happen. And it hurt Carter Page. He's an American citizen. And he should not be uh, surveilled if uh, all the ducks are not in a row the way they're supposed to be. And all the ducks were not in a row. But Carter Page was a bit player. It didn't affect those warrants, nor Carter Page affected anything with regard to, with regard to Mueller. 
So again, as we focus on all the stuff that happened in 2016, we're missing the bigger picture here. One last thing. There was a guy that was in the FBI uh, that no one had ever heard of outside the FBI named Kevin Kleinsmith. Kevin Kleinsmith, as part of one of these uh, warrants, he actually altered an email about Carter Page. And he omitted some, some wording that indicated that years earlier, Carter Page had actually been an informant for the FBI. Hmm. And he omitted that. And turns it in as part of the, the application to get a warrant to surveil him. The, the reason he omitted is obvious because if, if a judge is looking at that and he says, well, wait a minute, you're, you're saying he might be working with this foreign government, but in fact, he's worked for us and he's worked for us in a, then he might be less inclined to give it. And so this guy omits that. Well, guess what? That's a crime. And Kevin Kleinsmith uh, was convicted of that, of that crime. And I forget what he had to serve, you know, uh, three months. I, I don't know what it was. It wasn't, wasn't years, but it's a crime. And he was convicted of the crime and he should have been convicted of the crime. To my knowledge, that's the only crime that has been uh, convicted. Anyone's been convicted of with regard to this, but there are those messy, there are those messy issues. There's, there's no doubt about it. So the open of the investigation, according to the Horowitz report was good. The, in, the opening of the investigations uh, coming out of it, particularly for those four individuals was good. Struck and Page and Lisa Page and Carter Page, who aren't related, are bit players in the real investigation. And Struck was removed one month into the Mueller investigation. Now, I said that they're still looking into some of this. When Michael Horowitz in December of 19 gave his the results of his report and said what I read, the attorney general decided, he actually said this, he doesn't agree with what Horowitz put out. He said, I don't agree with you. I, I don't think that this investigation was properly started. He said that. Even though Horowitz spent all that time doing it, and that's his job, he said that, but the attorney general said, no, I don't think so. So he appointed a second guy. Guy's name is John Durham. And John Durham has been for over a well over a year now, has been looking into the uh, the issues on the starting of that. And that's why I said it's still going and don't know. What's going to come of that? President Trump was extremely hopeful that something was going to pop out of that before the election because he thought it might involve Obama and it might involve Biden and all that. Again, maybe it will. But to this point, that that's not the case. OK. All right. Yeah. All right. So if you're uh, still with us, this is a long yeah. one. <laughs> and uh, but we've got some important uh, things to progress on to. And so we want to make sure we don't make you wait a week for that. So if you need to press pause right now, grab a beverage, go to the restroom, <clears throat> come on back, and we're going to press forward. So Pastor Ken, I just want to give that uh, programming detail and then you can continue on. All right. Yeah. Thanks for staying with us. I'll try to uh, hasten as best I can. But now remember, I said there's the special counsel versus the independent counsel distinction. This is where it helps the president. The independent counsel report goes to Congress. Special counsel goes to the attorney general uh, and the special counsel works for the attorney general. By March of 2019, when the Mueller investigation is now completed, Trump had fired his original attorney general, Sessions. Remember I said he was furious with Sessions for recusing himself because uh, he thought that Sessions was his guy, in effect, and Sessions wouldn't mm -hmm. appoint a special counsel. But he recuses himself, goes to the second guy, Rod Rosenstein. Rod Rosenstein does it. He's furious with him for 18 months, criticizes him publicly, tweets about him. And after the elections in 2018, November of 2018, he fires him the day after. And he appoints a new attorney general, William Barr. And then Barr uh, has to go through Senate confirmation, all that. And I believe it was in February, uh, quite certain it was in February, that he was confirmed as the new attorney general. Well, William Barr was appointed by, selected by, by Trump as a guy who had written publicly that he didn't like the special counsel investigation that was going on. Hmm. So he comes in. Now you've got this precarious thing because... Um, because Robert Mueller has been doing his work for 22 months. And now you've got an attorney general under whom he is a new one, under whom he is now serving, as he starts to wrap up his uh, work, who has publicly said, I'm, I'm not in favor of this thing. Mueller finishes, gives the report, nearly 500-page report to Attorney General Barr. 
After a few days, Attorney General Barr issues a three and a half page memo. Now you got almost 500 pages. He issues a three and a half page summary. And he says that the report exonerates the president. No collusion, no obstruction of justice. And I, for one, can still remember that was a Sunday when he released that memo. And I can still remember that afternoon being stunned because I had been following this thing for 22 months that Mueller was doing his investigation. And I knew of all the indictments and all the convictions that had already been made public of Russians and Trump mm -hmm. campaign people. And yeah, yet he has. This I remember thing. you saying more than one time that this doesn't look good for the president. Right. Oh, absolutely. And I'd said to friends in my closest circle, like yourself, that, and then this comes out and I was just was stunned. Now it would be weeks before the actual report is given out. Uh, and even then after it was given, it was redacted. There are portions of it you can't read to this day, by the way, what you get for, you can download from the Justice Department website, it's still redacted. But by the time that it's released several weeks later, the die has been cast, the narrative has been set, they came up with nothing. Mm -hmm. Total exoneration. That no collusion phrase, with Russia. Yeah, yeah. No, oh, and I mean, are you kidding? The president went out on Twitter immediately, <laughs> as, you, as you might imagine. No obstruction of the investigation by the president. Then I finally get the report, read it, and it does not match what William Barr said in his three and a half page memo. It just doesn't. You, you, you have to read it. I'm going to give you some things that it says here in a little bit. In fact, Mueller himself wrote to Barr. After Barr put out that three-and-a-half-page memo, he writes to Barr on behalf of his team to say, you've misrepresented the report, a report the public did not even have. But again, the narrative had already been set. Mm -hmm. It followed the narrative that I gave at the beginning. It was focused on the start of the investigation, not what the separate Mueller investigation actually found. As I've said, the dossier for Mueller and the real investigation, the dossier, Carter Page, Peter Strzok and his girlfriend, they're not players or they're, or they're bit players. Mueller picked up uh, and, and brought his own team when he did his 22 months. Remember I said part of what the president kept saying is you've got these 17 angry Democrats. One of the things that fails to say is that Mueller himself is a lifelong Republican. Rod Rosenstein, who appointed him, is a lifelong Republican. Jeff Sessions, who recused himself, is a lifelong Republican. And this idea that there's no collusion is just not true, if no other reason, for this reason. <laughs> if you read the Mueller report, you don't have to read far. Page two, page two. Mueller says, we're not dealing with collusion. My mandate from the attorney general is to look into crimes, crimes. And the criminal code doesn't have collusion. That's not a, that's not a, a phrase used in the criminal code. So we're not looking at collusion. We're looking at criminal conspiracy. And then he defines what a conspiracy is, which is basically an explicit agreement. We found that you said, if you do this for me, I'll do this for you between so the can, Russians and the Trump. Can I campaign. clarify? So please, when, please. when he gives the short summary, he says no, no collusion. Right. Uh, and the president reiterates right. publicly, no collusion. But yeah. this is the this is the leaving out a part that you were talking about earlier. Uh, there's no collusion because we didn't look into collusion. Am I understanding that right? That's right. They're not even looking okay. into collusion. And, and think of it this way. Think of it this way. All conspiracy, every criminal conspiracy involves collusion, but not all collusion involves a criminal conspiracy. Mm -hmm. You can have collusion without having criminal conspiracy. But, but, but Mueller was only charged with looking for crimes. In fact, he did find numerous contacts between the Trump campaign and Russia for mutual benefit. Mm -hmm. In fact, let me read for you from the Mueller report. The investigation established multiple links between Trump campaign officials and individuals tied to the Russian government. Those links included Russian offers of assistance to the campaign. In some instances, the campaign was receptive to the offer. It does say in other instances, the campaign officials shied away. They not only had numerous contacts did the campaign with Russia, 
here's what's really uh, indicting, indicting. And I don't mean that in a legal sense, although, yeah, it would be uh, if pursued. They lied and covered it up. As proven in courts of law over 22 months, where 34 people were indicted or convicted and some went to prison. Some were the Russians. This is all coming out of the Mueller uh, probe. The Russians who actually stole information from the Democrat, uh, the DNC, Democrat National Committee. They hacked it. They stole it. They gave it to WikiLeaks. One of the people who was convicted was well, so not only the Russians, they indicted and convicted the Russians who are in Russia. We'll never see them in jail because obviously they're not going to be extradited here. But they named them. If you read the report, they name who they are, where they were. It's amazing how they were forensically able to chase us down. One of the people convicted was a, a guy who was serving as, in effect, a campaign consultant, Roger Stone. He spoke with Julian Assange of WikiLeaks regularly to coordinate the drops of information to benefit the campaign. President Trump spoke regularly with Roger Stone about that. According to Mueller and according to, not just Mueller, according to the uh, select the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. And that uh, Senate Select Committee on Intelligence called the contacts between Trump's campaign manager, Paul Manafort, and a, a Russian military intelligence offer, officer, Konstantin Kalimnik, called it a, quote, grave threat to national security. And the Senate committee, intelligence committee, suggested the president lied when he said he did not recall speaking with Roger Stone at all, let alone about these kinds of matters. That Senate committee is run by Republicans. That report that says what I told you was signed off on by the chairman, Republican chairman of that committee. Stone lied, Roger Stone, he intimidated witnesses and he was convicted in a court of law. He was a few weeks ago pardoned by President Trump. Paul That's, Manafort, okay? I, I was you, just gonna say that, yeah, that doesn't, uh, <laughs> that doesn't speak well. Uh, but, normally so, the pardon power is not used that way. Normally the pardon mm -hmm. power is not used to pardon people who were involved in some affair that involved you. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I can't, I'm trying to think of the only one that I can think of that comes close to that is Sco a guy named Scooter Libby. Uh, he was involved in the Iran Contra thing. Um, and uh, Iran Contra, Iran Contra, nah, nah, it wasn't Iran Contra. Uh, he had leaked the name of a CIA operative to a journalist and he got in control. He lied about that. He lied about it. So anyway, he was pardoned. Uh, but, that's about the only one I can think of. This one involves the president, involves his mm -hmm. campaign, and numerous people are given pardons through this. And can, can I Roger ask a Stone. question or, or point out something here that I, I can maybe hear people wondering? Yeah. Um, so we're saying is the deep state, we're answering the question today, is the deep state out to get Donald Trump? And here you're showing there are all these uh, Republican leaders in the Senate and in, along the way who are involved in this. And and so some of this is just undeniable. And so they're they're doing their job. They're acknowledging that these things have happened, regardless mm -hmm. of their party affiliation or, or loyalties. And uh, it's tempting for us, uh, and I hear people do this regularly, say uh, of things that have happened just recently, if any of the Republicans don't side with their party on it, well, they're a Republican in name only, or they mm -hmm. are, mm -hmm. they can't be trusted mm -hmm. anymore. They're a coward, mm -hmm. they're, mm -hmm. and, that's what someone might be thinking about these folks. Whereas you're just pointing out people are going along the process, looking at evidence, letting it lead them wherever it may, right? Yeah, at least some are, right? Yeah, and the people that I'm talking about did that. Yeah, exactly. Now, let that, me that's, something that's a good up. point too. Sorry, you, you said at least some are. <clears throat> I, I don't mean to make it sound no. like uh, everybody's no. above board and nobody would do anything but, wrong. Of course right. not, but we have systems in place to try to ferret that out and to mitigate it, right? Yeah. If you go, all of this stuff that Stone is doing, this is all during the 2016 campaign. So here, you got to, you got to understand the timeline here. This is when the FBI is looking into this stuff and they're getting this chatter. They're getting these indications. Yes. The, the dossier is, is doing its thing, getting its reports, but they're getting their own stuff. And you've got Stone doing what he did. This is during the 2016 campaign. 
and the campaign manager for the Trump campaign, Paul Manafort, the campaign manager, for heaven's sake, is during the 2016 campaign meeting with a Russian intelligence officer, a military intelligence officer, and he's giving him campaign data. Now, you, you could come up with some reason for that. He lied about it. He's convicted. He signs a plea deal with Mueller's people. He then, while he's under this plea deal where he's supposed to cooperate, he cheats on the cooperation. I, I'm not making that up. Hmm. So then he's convicted. He's going to jail. And guess what happened with Paul Manafort? He gets pardoned. Hmm. Paul Manafort got pardoned. Now, all of that is happening in 2016, the very time that the claim by the narrative is that it's the FBI that's rogue and it's these other people that are rogue. It's all this is happening at that time. Don Jr., Donald Trump Jr., has a meeting in June of 2016 during the campaign. He's The Mueller people got this email that went to Don Jr. The email says this is from a Russian who's saying, as part of our effort to help your father become president. That's what it says. Hmm. We want to meet with you because we have information that will harm your opponent, Hillary Clinton. Don Jr. writes back and says, if it's what you, it's, I'm quoting, if it's what you say it is, I love it. They have that meeting. Don Jr., Paul Manafort, the campaign manager, and two or three, two at least, I think it was three Russians. Now, they say they never did exchange any information. And I don't know that there's, there, I haven't seen any proof that the actual information, but that's not the point. The point is you're working with the Russians and you're saying, if you've got it, I want it. Hmm. And they've got that in documented evidence. Trump said he had no business in Russia. Turns out during the campaign, his lawyer, his slash fixer, Michael Cohen, was act actively pursuing a Moscow hotel with Trump in, in the loop. Michael Flynn. Michael Flynn, uh, when Trump got elected in November of 2016, you have the couple months before the inauguration, the period we're in right now, he was appointed by President Trump, then President-elect Trump, to be his national security advisor. He speaks with, in late December of 2016, the Russian ambassador, a man named Kislyak. There would be nothing unusual about that. Uh, when normally when you have incoming uh, officials, they want to get up to speed on what's happening. There's nothing untoward about that. Here's the deal though. Uh, because the Russians had been meddling in the 2016 election, President Obama, outgoing President Obama, imposed sanctions on Russia, kicked some diplomats out, as a matter of fact. And, and, Michael Flynn talks to Kislyak and he says, hey, look, and I'm paraphrasing, but look, hold on. We'll take care of these uh, sanctions that have been put on you. And that raised some concern within the uh, national security uh, community. They're listening to that call. Now, the reason they're listening to the call is they always listen to Russians calls. They're not listening to it necessarily about Michael Flynn. They're listening to it because it's got the Russian ambassador on it. And they hear him say this. All right. Now, this is where it gets interesting. That recording gets leaked to the Washington Post. Don't know who leaked it. Leaking is illegal, but it happens in all administrations. I'm not saying it's okay. It's illegal. And whoever, whoever did it, if they got found out, but it's the Washington Post, they print that, that uh, the incoming Trump administration is going to reverse these. And uh, Vice President Pence is asked about it. And Pence says, no, we haven't had any talks like that. And then somebody goes and says, you know, I think Flynn did. And Pence goes to Flynn and Flynn says, no, I didn't. They got him on a recording <laughs> doing it. He lies to the vice president. The FBI comes and talks to Flynn and Flynn lies to the FBI about it. Three weeks later, the president fired Michael Flynn for lying to the vice president. That then got 
the that then got the Russia investigation, which had started in July of 2016. This is now the end of 2016. But that really got people concerned hmm. because now the Russians can blackmail Michael Flynn because they know he's lied to the vice president. So they go and tell other officials, hey, we got a problem here. Flynn ends up getting uh, Flynn ends up getting fired by Trump for lying to the FBI. He gets convicted. But he's not going to get much jail time. I think he wasn't going to get any jail time. Now, stay with me here. He was going to uh, have an agreement. He confessed. He went before the court and confessed twice in court. Yes, mm -hmm. I lied. Yes, I knowingly lied. Yes, I knew what I was doing. You know, you've seen courts do that. The judge says, are you doing this with sound mind? Are you doing this of your own volition? You know, no one coerced you the whole bit. He goes through the whole thing. He does it twice. But over time, this narrative that, hey, wait a minute, this was all a setup. Michael Flynn was set up. That narrative started to take hold. And he fired his attorneys and he hired a new attorney. Guess who his new attorney was? Sidney released the crack in Powell. Oh, who has shown up again on the election with all the, that's where most people got to know her. She became Michael Powell's, or excuse me, Michael Flynn's uh, uh, attorney. And now the thing drags on for another year, year and a half. And the judge in the case is ticked mm. because this guy had stood before him twice and said this, and now he's saying, no, I didn't do it. Mm. And it created this huge problem the attorney general got involved and said, you know what, we, we're the Justice Department isn't going after the FBI is not going after Michael Flynn anymore. The judge said, no, you can't withdraw it. I mean, it really got strange. Guess who got pardoned? Michael Flynn. So the Russians sought help. The campaign welcomed that help. People lied over and over again. And they were pardoned by the president. Hmm. Volume two of the Mueller report. I'm almost done. Thanks for your indulgence. Volume two, there's two volumes. Volume two is the largest of the two. And it's about obstruction of justice. Because during the Mueller investigation, they have all these people saying, I'm going to cooperate, but then they're lying in their cooperation. And they also uncovered that there was this dangling of pardons if you don't if you don't cooperate with the Mueller investigation. So here's what the Mueller report said about obstruction on the part of the president. If we had confidence after a thorough investigation of the facts that the present president clearly did not commit obstruction of justice, we would so state. Based on the facts and the applicable legal standards, however, we are unable to reach that judgment. Hmm. That's the way they left it. Now, that's a weird way to leave it, man. Just kind of hanging there. Now, why did they do that? They say, according to the applicable legal standards, they went on. To, he went on to say, Mueller did in a news conference, this under longstanding Justice Department policy, a president cannot be charged with a federal crime while he is in office. That's unconstitutional. Even if the charge is kept under seal and hidden from public view, that, too, is prohibited. He added, quote, the special counsel's office is part of the Department of Justice, and by regulation, it was bound by that department policy. Charging the president with a crime was therefore not an option we could consider. Do you see what's being said here? It's not he didn't commit a crime. Hmm. Can't charge okay. him with it. Can't charge him with it. And then he laid out two reasons. I, please, guys, I'm almost done. Stay with us. He laid out two reasons why, two other reasons why he didn't come to a conclusion on whether or not he could charge Trump with a crime. The first is that if he suggested Trump ob obstructed justice without charging him, and he couldn't do that, then it would have deprived Trump of an opportunity to defend himself as he normally could in a court of law. In other words, I'm not going to put in my report that I think he committed a crime without charging him, but I can't charge him. <laughs> because if I put in there that I think he committed a crime, it's unfair to him. It's unfair to Trump because he doesn't have the opportunity to defend himself in court. Here's the mind-blowing thing. Here's this guy actually looking after Trump's interest on this. And then the second thing he said is, and, and go ahead. Looking after his interest, but it's being depicted as out to get him. Oh, totally. Right. Right. Yeah. Totally. Okay. Totally. Exactly. The second thing he said was, even if prosecutors had filed a sealed indictment, there's the chance that it could leak. And filing an indictment in the first place, he said, would have been against uh, department policy. So, guys, I'm almost done. 
being president has protected the president from prosecution. And he's protected others with pardons. Hmm. He loses that protection in a few days. Now, the president has really tried harder than anybody we've ever seen in our lives, or I think ever in history, to hang on to the presidency, right? I mean, the lengths to which he's gone. Mm -hmm. And I don't know his, I, I, look, I'll just, I don't know his motivations. I know one side says, well, it's because he's a patriot and he's given up, uh, he's given up money and all kinds of things because he wants to serve the country. I, I hope that's what it is. I hope that's what it is. I do. I genuinely hope that. I can. I don't know what it, I can tell you. This that remaining president means you are immune from prosecution, and when you are no longer president, you are no longer immune. The Southern District of New York has a grand jury that's been meeting for the better part of two years on President Trump's finances. Do you remember that he's the only president in modern times unwilling to give up his taxes? They now have his taxes. It took them years to go to court to get the taxes. They have them and they're waiting. I don't, we'll see what happens with that. The moment he's no longer president, they can pursue that. I expect what happens next are more pardons. Pardons of Rudy, Rudy Giuliani and others who uh, have been helpful. Perhaps the family, Don Jr. And then it's going to be interesting to see if the president tries to pardon himself. Nobody's ever done that. It, it clearly can't be constitutional. We'll see if he tries. Um, if he does, it only covers federal crimes. It doesn't cover state crimes. And that Southern District of New York is a whole state crime, state crime thing. Why did Russia want him to be president? What relationship do they have, if any? We don't, we don't know the answer uh, to that. But maybe after he's no longer president, maybe we'll, we'll know those. So mm. I'm done. Those who focus on the first part of the FBI investigation – what you're doing is you're obscuring what happened with the actual investigation. And it's ingrained in your thinking. But here's what I'm telling you. By doing that, you've been misled. Mm -hmm. And you've adopted a narrative that's not true for four years. And in turn, that's affected the way you see other things then. This is just another thing like that thing to get at the, the president. Is the deep state out to get Donald Trump? I don't see it. Mm -hmm. And if you'll read the full Mueller report, if you'll read the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence report. I think you will clearly see that. Thanks. Mm. Thanks for listening. Pastor Ken, thanks for going over that. I mean, that there is so much content and the actual legal documents, difficult, any legal document, difficult to uh, wade through. And uh, your interest in this area uh, has allowed you and, and, you know, your time available has allowed you to do that. And we appreciate you lending that to us. Um, it, it is difficult to sort through this. I can understand why if all I'm getting is uh, tidbits from the news or things on social media, particularly from folks that are, you know, will tend to be sympathetic, why I might have a, you know, a skewed view of this. But this has been very helpful. And uh, so thank you, those of you at home who've stuck through us this whole uh, yeah. <laughs> over an hour episode now. We don't oh, normally well. do them that long. Uh, no. But uh, I hope it's been worth your time. And I hope it uh, helps give you context to some of the things Pastor Ken and I have talked about recently and why uh, why we're urging you to uh, to consider these details, because really the you know, the, the details matter on these things. And uh, um, okay. consider this. Yeah. You say what we're urging you to consider is consider expanding your sources. Mm -hmm. If your sources keep driving you toward the first part and not the actual investigation, then something's wrong here. And so you need to, if they've misled you in that way, it's misled for four years now. We don't want that to happen again. That's what I'm really, really, really trying to get everyone to consider. Okay. Thanks. Wonderful. Yeah. <clears throat> Just a reminder then before we let you go that uh, follow us on Facebook, look for announcements of what's coming up and uh, new content being available there, as well as our YouTube channel. Whoops, switched my camera <laughs> off there. And uh, if you uh, don't already subscribe to us on YouTube, do that and uh, you'll get updates and notifications when new content comes out. Pastor Ken, thank you. Everybody at home, thank you for watching and we'll see you next time. 
you have a question you'd like us to consider, you can send that into our email address, info at cbctrenton.com, or text it to us at 97000.